ascertain conjecture of a time when creepy murmur in the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp, through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds, that the fixed sentinels almost receive the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire, and through their paley flames each battle sees the other's umbered face. Steed threatens steed in high and boastful days, piercing the night's dull ear. And from the tents, the armorers accomplishing the knights, with busy hammers closing rivets up, give dreadful note of preparation. Oh, the poor condemned English, like sacrifices, by their watchful fires, sit patiently and inly ruminate the morning's danger. Oh no, who will behold the royal captain of this ruined band, walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent. For forth he goes and visits all his hosts, bids them good morrow with a modest smile, and calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen. Upon his royal face there is no note how dread an army hath enrounded him, nor doth he dedicate one jot of color unto the weary and all watched night, but freshly looks and overbears a taint with cheerful semblance and a sweet majesty that every wretch, pining and pale before, beholding him, plucks comfort from his looks. A largest universal, like the sun, his liberal eye doth give to everyone, thawing cold fear, that mean and gentle all behold, as may unworthiness define, a little touch of hairy in the nights. Westmoreland, tis true that we are in great danger, the greater therefore should our courage be. Good morrow, Brother York. God Almighty, there is some soul of goodness in things evil. Would men observingly distill it out? For our bad neighbors makes us early risers, which is both helpful and good husbandry. Besides, they are our outward consciences and preachers to us all, admonishing that we may dress us fairly for our end. Thus we may gather honey from the weed and make a mortal of the devil himself. Good morrow, Uncle Exeter. Good soft pillow for that good white head were better than a churlish chirp of France. Not so, my liege. This lodging likes me better, since I may say now lie, I like it. <laughs> Tis good for men to love their present pains upon example, so the spirit is eased. And when the mind is quickened out of doubt, the organs, though defunct and dead before, break their drowsy grave and newly move with casted sloth and fresh legerity. Lend me that cloak, Uncle. And brothers both, commend me to the princes in our camp. Do my good morrow to them all, and anon desire them all to my pavilion. We shall, my liege. Shall I attend your grace? No, my good uncle. Go with my brothers to my pavilion. <coughs> I and my bosom must debate a while, and then I would no other company. May the Lord in heaven bless thee. <coughs> God of mercy, old heart, thou speakest cheerfully. Voila! A friend, discuss unto me, art thou officer or art thou base, common, and popular? I'm a gentleman of a company. Trails thou the puissant pipe. Even so, what are you? As good a man as the emperor. <laughs> then you are better than the king. The king <laughs> is a ballcock and a heart of gold, a lad of life, an imp of fame, a parent's good, a fist's most valiant. I kiss his dirty shoe, and from heartstring I love the lovely bully. What is thy name? Harry Leroy. Leroy. A Cornish name. Art thou of Cornish crew? No, I'm a Welshman. <laughs> Knowest thou Fluellen? Yes. Tell her I'll knock her leak about her pate upon St. Davy's Day. <coughs> Do not wear your dagger in your cap on that day, lest she knock that about yours. <laughs> Art thou her friend? <laughs> and her kinsman, too. Then the figo for thee, then. I thank thee. God be with you. My name is Pistol Call. It sorts well with your fierceness. <laughs> Captain Fluella! In the name of Daisy Christ, you! <laughs> it is the greatest admiration in the universal world when the true and ancient prerogatives and laws of war is not kept. If you would take but the pains to examine the wars of Pompey the Great, you shall find, I warrant you, that there is no 
tittle tattle nor pibble pabble in poppy's care. I warrant you, you shall find the ceremonies of war, the cares of it, and the forms of it, and the sobriety of it, and the modesty of it to be otherwise. Why, the enemy is loud, you hear them all night. If the enemy is an ass and a fool and a priding coxcomb, is it me think you that we should also look you be an ass, a fool, and a priding coxcomb in your own conscience now? <laughs> I will lower my voice. I pray you and beseech you that you will. Though it seem a little out of fashion, there is much care and valor in this wellspring. Nim, is not that the morning which breaks yonder? I think it be, but we have no great cause to desire the approach of the day. We see yonder the beginning of the day, but I think we shall never see the end of it. <coughs> Who goes there? A friend. Under what captain serve you? Under Sir Thomas Urbino. A good old commander and a most kind gentleman. I pray you, what thinks he of our estate? Even as men wrecked upon a sand that look to be washed off the next tide. He hath not told us thought to the king. No, nor does me he should. For though I speak it to you, I think the king is but a man as I am. The, the violet <laughs> smells to him as enough to me. The element looks to him as enough to me. He, his ceremonies laid by, in his nakedness he appears but a man. Uh, though his affections are higher mounted than ours are, when they stoop, they stoop with a like wind. Therefore, when he sees fears, the reason of fears as we do, his fears, out of doubt, be of the same relish as ours are. Yet, in reason, no man should possess him with the appearance of fear, lest he, by showing it, his heart in his own. He may show what outward courage he will, but I believe, as cold a night as it is, he can wish himself in Thames up to the neck. And I would he were, and I with him, as in all adventures, would we were quit you. By my troth, I speak my conscience of the king. I think he would not wish himself anywhere but where he is. Oh! But let him be here alone. And should he be sure to be ransomed and many a poor man's life saved? I dare say you love him not so ill to wish him here alone. Howsoever, you speak this to feel other men's minds. Methinks I could not die anywhere so content than in the king's company. His cause being just and his quarrel honorable. That's more than we know. I or more than we should seek to look after. But we know enough if we know that we are the king's subjects. For if his cause be wrong, then our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. But if his cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make. With all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in a battle, shall join together at the latter day and cry, we died at such a place. Some screaming, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the debts they owe, some upon their children rawly left. For I am afeard there are few die well that die in a battle. For how can anything be charitably disposed of when blood is their argument? Now if these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the king who has led them to it. Who to disobey would be against all proportion of subjection. So, if a son that is by his father sent about as mercy does, do sinfully miscarry upon the sea, the imputation of his wickedness by your rule should be imposed upon his father who sent him? Or, or, if a servant under his master's command, carrying a sum of money, be assailed by robbers and die in many irreconcilable iniquities, you would call the business of the master, the author of the servant's damnation, but this is not so. The king is not called to answer for the particular endings of his soldiers, the father of his son, nor the servant of his, the master of his servant, for they purpose not their death when they purpose their services. To certain every man that dies ill, the ill upon his own head, the king is not to answer for it. I do not desire he should answer for me, but I am determined to fight lustily for him. I myself heard the king say he would not be ransomed. Aye, he said so, to make us fight cheerfully. But then when our throats are cut, he may be ransomed, and we never the wiser. If ever I live to see it, I'll never trust his word after. You pay him then. That's a perilous shot out of an elder gun that a poor and private displeasure can do against a monarch. He may as well go about to turn the sun to ice with fanning in his face with a peacock's feather. You'll never trust his word after calm, tis a foolish saying. 
Your reproof is something too round. I should be angry with you at the time of convenience. Don't let it be a quarrel between us. If you live. <laughs> I embrace you. How shall I know thee again? Give me any gauge of thine. I shall wear it in my bonnet. If ever thou darest acknowledge it, I will make it my quarrel. Here's my glove. <laughs> Give me another of thine. There. <laughs> this will I also wear in my cap. If ever thou come to me and say after tomorrow, this is my glove, by this hand I will take thee a fox on the ear. If ever I live to see it, I will challenge it. Thou darest as well be high. Well, I do, though I take thee in the king's company. Keep thy word, fare thee well. Be friends, you English fools, be friends. We've got French quarrels now, if you can tell how to reckon. Indeed. <laughs> the French may lay 20 French crowns to one, they will, they will beat us, for they bear them on their shoulders. But tis no English treason to cut French crowns, and tomorrow the king himself will be a clipper. On the king. May we our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our sins, all lay upon the king. We must bear all. But what sort of God art thou that suffers more of mortal griefs than do thy worshippers? What are thy rents? What are thy comings in? What is thy soul of adoration? Art thou aught else but place, degree, and form, creating awe and fear in other men? Thinkest thou the fiery fever will go out with titles blown from adulation? Will it give place to flexure and low bending? Canst thou, when thou commandest the beggar's knee, command the health of it? No, no, thou proud dream, that playest so subtly with the king's repose, for I am a king that find thee. I know, does not the sword, the mace, the crown imperial, the throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. No, not all these, thrice gorgeous ceremony, not all these laid in bed majestical can sleep so soundly as does the wretched slave who with body filled in vacant mind gets himself to rest crammed with distressful bread. Such a wretch winding up his days with toil and his nights with sleep. A slave, a member of the country's peace, enjoys it, but gross brain little watts. What watch the king keeps to maintain the peace, whose hours the peasant best advantages? My lord, your nobles, jealous of your absence, do seek through your camp to find you. Good old knight. Collect them all together at my tent. I'll be before you. I will do it. O God of battles, seal my soldiers' hearts. Possess them not with fear. Take from this, from them this sense of reckoning if the opposed number should pluck their hearts from them. My liege. Aye, my cousin Westmoreland's voice. I, I know they are, and I'll be before thee. The day my friends in all things stay for me. <laughs> 